Okay, I can get started. Steve, uh, first off, let me thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon that's beautiful. Uh, especially when I've just uploaded both the, uh, the PowerPoints and the paper to explain all this. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, access it now from the wiki, so you don't have to take notes or remember anything, it's all on the wiki. Um, and you can take a look at that. The title is nice and misleading. Uh, as though this were exam soft or something like that. Where, But self-graded exams, which is what I call it, is misleading only in that I don't use this particular mechanism for the purposes of grading students and giving them some grade that would be assigned. But let me explain and go back to the beginning, if I can get this thing to work. Um, most faculty, or at least most people I know, complain about two things. One is that the quality of student writing. Uh, which is mostly a problem of analysis, not grammar, uh, but straying off of irrelevancies and not seeing things. Uh, and the other part of the complaint is, and then I have to grade it, uh, which is the real bane. The re you know, most of us say the reason we get paid is because we have to grade. Uh, the rest of the job is fun, but that one's not. From a student's perspective, though, uh, they don't get that much feedback when they do do ess uh, uh, write essays. And for most faculty in most courses, uh, multiple choice exams or true false exams are not an adequate way of testing students. They both give away what uh, the issue is going to be in the multiple choice answer. You're, Narrowed, you know what the issue is because it has to be something that will be answered by one of these four things. Uh, and they give no opportunity for an explanation of assumptions or not assumptions. Uh, so most uh, examinations are, in fact, essay questions. Uh, and yet, when the student takes the essay question, a small percentage, very small, come back into your office to ask, what did I do wrong? And after a short point this out, point that out, they're satisfied that, boy, they must have missed a whole lot of things and they go home miserable. They don't really understand exactly why they went wrong or what could be better about it. And first year students particularly are getting very anxious about this whole examination process and what's it like. We try to give practice examination. You give them practice examinations and you might show a model answer or go through the answer. But again, you don't get to, the spe to each specific individual. You could do it, but it would take up an enormous amount of your time. And that most of us are not willing to give up. And so that's the problem, at least the problem that I've seen it, that uh, partly solved uh, simply by chats, by posing a, a problem online and having the students able to answer it. And, get online and monitor those discussions. Uh, that still is going to involve you considerably over time. And students may easily turn out of it, tune off of that. And they don't get any particular exercise in writing. So like most faculty that I know, um, I sort of groused about thought, gee, it would be nice to have essay questions uh, in the middle of the year, but I don't want to grade them. <laughs> and so forget about it. About a quarter of a century ago, that's a real disgusting thought. A quarter of a century ago, I went to Australia and met this guy, Alan Tyree. Um, this is this guy. Uh, and he's got his own web page on the theory and practice of teaching. But Alan developed a mechanism for getting students to grade their own essay questions. 
Uh, and that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, to find it, he's written four papers uh, on this methodology. If you go onto his website, learn about him. Uh, he's still around. You can even send inquiries to him to get details of it. Of these four, notice the last one. The, each, several of them talk about the Keller plan because they're based on uh, an educational expert called Fred Keller who said what education is about is mastery education. What mastery is, is determining what it is you want your students to learn and then making sure that they learn it and understand it before going on to the next step. Um, this is something which seems to me we don't do very much of in law schools, that is, think in highly specific and broken down terms of what it is that we want the students to learn exactly and how do we test for that. Uh, but it's quite widely done in schools of education discussed as the mechanism for teaching. Uh, just not real happy here. Of Alan's four papers, Several of the papers are on how this plan worked and it was implemented uh, at Sydney uh, and how you can do it. What he did was pretty simple idea, very simple idea. It's simply ask an essay question. Uh, I mean, his, his total plan, total project was the, the, came from a philosophy of teaching from Fred Keller. The idea of mastery, set out what your goals are, uh, what students must learn, do it on a self-paced basis, test whether they have learned it, and then they can go on to the next unit. Uh, in implementing that, let me see if I can run this off. He. Alan created a system, implemented the Keller system at the University of Sydney across the board in a first year course and in his intellectual property course. He did that 25 years ago to what he thought was great success. It has never been accepted and to my knowledge I'm the only person in the United States who uses this exercise. Um, just why is that? Um, one possibility is suggested by the name of the article that Fred Keller wrote about his ideas. <laughs> but, uh, I don't think it's really true that this is, that, that even in the extreme version that Alan came up with, uh, the teacher is no longer appropriate. But what Alan did, uh, did produce for those students who used his mechanism as opposed to having a live tutor talking to them, students actually ended up doing better than simply uh, used the computer assisted program and didn't have the weekly meeting with the tutor, which is a frightening thought. What I'm going to do now is try to show you what we have. Um, That's, again, you can get that so you can get on the website and you can get this. Here is uh, test your knowledge of contracts. I'll do question one. Okay. The idea is ask a question. It can be simple. It can be complex. You can read this. This is, a, I hope, a simple one. Uh, Sally, dedicated first year students, wants to uh, learn, offer, and acceptance through negotiation. So she offers us for sale a Picasso, uh, left to her by her grandmother, negotiates for delivery. Uh, he offers 5,000, she accepts, they write an sign an agreement that she's drafted for the sale of the Picasso for $5,000. Then she says, I was just kidding. I really want to sell this. And he says, hey, I want the Picasso and tries to enforce the contract. Assuming 
you want to test your knowledge of contract law, what would you advise her? Um, I can do audience participation. Because <laughs> the student has to write an answer here. That's what this space is for. Uh, I'll put in, uh, since I've got to put, a, put something in, But what you're expecting from the student is a full answer, which would see the disparity in price as potential for uh, finding that John, was that his name? So sort of two issues. The, what's behind there is going to be an objective theory of contract that you are bound by what a reasonable person would think uh, you were doing. Uh, by all indications, her behavior shows that she is seriously intending, and so she is bound by that offer that she has made to go through with the contract unless he had reason to know that she wasn't really serious about that. The only thing that would indicate that might be the disparity in price. So we can write a, a, a little short essay, and, but the disparity is probably not that great depending on the nature of the Picasso, which we don't uh, have the facts. So you can write a short little essay, but it's only one issue. It's a very simple and straightforward thing to deal with. Then the student has to submit the essay. This obviously is pretty short, um, and it's also true as you we'll see quickly, that you could have put in total nonsense here. Uh, because what this really is, is taking the tree um, form of multiple, uh, of, of uh, uh, program to follow you down. Have you advised that John may enforce or, uh, the contract? Either yes or no. But it's asking you this based on you got the answer that hopefully you've written out a complete answer, not this half baked one. Um, and the question will say, what did you say? And that's why I'm talking about this as a self graded exam. Is you take the exam question and then you have to respond as a student to what is it that you've said. Did you say John could enforce it? In this case, I think I said he did. Objective theory says yes. And you get another one, which says the common law says it's the objective theory. Uh, did you explain that in your answer? Well, it's not just did you get the right answer, but did you explain what the basis for it was? Yes submit that. Suppose John's another student in the class, so what else you can do with this is take the student who's written the essay question and then probe with facts changes. That's just a simple part of the tree. Suppose John's also in the class, knows what Sally's doing, uh, and then decides it's such a good deal he wants to enforce it. Do you think he has a good chance of success? Let's say yes, because we're not that smart. Uh, and what you get back is the restatement says it's what a reasonable person would know. Do you know an exception to the rule uh, that would allow John to enforce the contract? Now, you can actually say yes. It doesn't matter what you say. You'll get somewhere. I don't actually know of an exception, because John's going to be stuck. And that gives me the end point which was, okay, now that you've written the essay, gone through and said what you've said in the essay, here's a response that explains what was in this question. Um, and it also prints out all of your responses to the questions about your answer, so everything is there to go back and review what you've done. Uh, yeah, submit.
I set this up, which was not necessary at all. Whoops. Say no, yes. <laughs> Just say no. I've got to learn that sometime. <laughs> uh, go back to the formation menu. Make another point. That was taking one simple yes no issue about as easy and, and straightforward as you can get. What you can do, uh, you can pick up multiple issues uh, rather than just a single issue uh, without any difficulty. It's an example of that kind of question. Um, where Seymour, in the final stages of his illness, uh, says, uh, tells Frank he'll leave his entire estate if Frank promises to name the first son after Seymour. Frank asks for some time to think about it. Seymour says, I'm going fast. Be quick. If you agree, send me a letter by Federal Express. Three days later, Frank's out of town. Seymour dies on his deathbed. Seymour tells Frank's wife to tell Frank to forget about the offer. He's leaving everything to the order of odd fellows. Two weeks after the funeral, Frank sends a certified letter. What arguments can the executor use to refute uh, or to refuse to honor the acceptance? The point of this is no question that the plaintiff is going to lose on this one. The executor doesn't have to honor it. But you've got a whole lot of different arguments, both in the form of uh, in ways it wasn't accepted. Now, if you're a lazy son of a gun, you can just put junk down. But for students who are trying to use this, and the reason that I've used it, is to get students to write and look at what they've written, to ask them to do that and to say, you're cheating yourself if you don't. Uh, and so most students are going to try to answer the question. And then they'll get run through. Have you considered this argument? And so on down the line with the different arguments issue by issue. If you were asked what were the arguments, yeah, here's the arguments. Now, let me see if I can pop out. Let me just take one more uh, on damages. Both of those were examples where here is a general proposition of law. There are answers. You could have do, done that with a multiple choice question. I'm just curious, have, have you ever tried, you know, because this system is built on the idea of sort of a marking, right? You've got a question in an exam, sort of a note that was used that you were looking for. Have you ever done this where you've taken a final exam that you've given in the past, put it back up, and, and sort of issue spot it through with the same sort of structure? Uh, yes, let's see if I've got the right one. Here's one. <laughs> it was the damages aspect of a, of a question. Client's a computer manufacturer who has been promised delivery of memory chips. Uh, chips don't arrive on the 15th, so there's a breach of the contract. Supplier indicates it may not arrive for another month. Your client on the 18th finds another supplier for a third of the order, but his purchasing department has to work overtime. Shipping costs are higher. He's already hired testers. Uh, three weeks later, your client orders the remainder. Why all that? All that because we've got issues of delay. We've got issues of uh, reliance damages, expectation damages. In other words, a a sufficient number of damages so it's a gradable question instead of just yes, no. Um, and then the students respond to that. And in fact, just as for most faculty who don't really like the idea of thinking up something new again, <laughs> taking an old exam question is the perfect way to do this. 
You take the old exam question, ask the student to answer it, and when they've answered it with whatever they stick in here, they have to submit it and they're going to get to these same questions. Your client can be entitled to reliance. Did you consider, did you consider that? What about the incidental cost of finding another supplier? I've considered everything, right? The supplier may argue there's an unreasonable delay. Would it be successful? There's still going to be a question about unreasonable delay. Probably should have said no. But whichever answer I give will produce a different question uh, to get me to follow down. The supplier said it would be at least a month before we were able to perform. If the client was able to cover immediately, waiting three weeks would be too long. So it sort of explains. So the student who's taking this has written the answer and then gets an immediate feedback as to here are what the issues are that you should have discussed. Here's what the points are uh, as you go through. And did you remember mitigation? Yes. Recruiting is not foreseeable, and so on, down the line with the feedback. Here are different kind of elements of damages. Here were your answers down below. Submit and go back to the damages menu. But that was an example of a question that I used. What I've done with those particular questions, though, is more simple-minded than I should. I'm too lazy to go back and get a little bit more elaborate, because there's more you can say in each case. But you take the grading chart that you were using for that question and just say, did you hit this issue? Did you hit this issue? Did you hit this issue? And you can get a little bit more sophisticated because you sh there should have been arguments. You know, if you said yes, uh, there are consequential damages. Well, did you consider certain reasons why this might not have been foreseeable. Or if you say it's, there's no consequential damages, did you consider why it might not be foreseeable? And so you can bring the student along to understand what the elements are of that. So I guess my question is, is the instruction class that you're teaching, do you do this ongoing through your concepts throughout the semester? Yes. Actually, when I, when I did it, I would have it put up only at the end of each unit, okay? The finished formation, suddenly the button appears. <laughs> you can now, and I tell students, don't take these until you think you're comfortable with this material because it doesn't do you any good just to crack open a book. The, the point of this is to see what you know and to see if you can answer it in this way. And so it's, it's really a chapter, an end of chapter test for, uh, here you have nine questions on offer and acceptance, or nine questions on damages. Yes? Um, I have two questions. One is sort of just a technical question is, is the template that you have in the software is available somewhere? Um, and the second thing is, the second thing is, I'm sort of looking through your, uh, your Picasso thing as well. It, it, it's not clear to me, is there a difference in the feedback that students receive regardless of whether they answer yes or no? In other words, when they, do they actually branch it or are they just getting the same feedback? Am I asking a no, You're asking a, a sensible question, but the answer is yes and no. It's branching so that if you say yes, it takes you to this question, right. and if you say no, it takes you to a different question. Is it At the end, when you come down to the end, right. the feedback in terms of let me tell you about this whole question right. that I've written out That's is the same right. no matter what you've written. So if you, um, the first question, if the, if the, correct, if, you know, if, if the correct answer is yes, you answered yes. Yeah. The, the reason for holding my fingers up like that is a question like this one. Right. 
Your client is a, a semi-professional clown who comes to birthday parties. Uh, he's got a two-year agreement uh, with the National Tobacco Company to play Puffet stuff. Three months into the agreement, they breach. No issue of breach. The question is, does he have to take work at birthday parties in mitigation? Or can he claim I'm a national spokesman like Ronald McDonald and I don't have to do that kind of horrible stuff anymore? I just want to be a national spokesman so I don't have to mitigate that way. Well, we've got arguments both ways. So we put in our normal junk <laughs> answer and submit. Have you advised being a client is not substantially similar work with which your client could mitigate damages? If I say yes, that it's not substantially similar work, that will take me one place. If I say no, it will take me another place. But there's not a right answer to that. No, I understand that. But is, is the feedback that they're going to get different when they answer yes or no to that question? Well, that, that seems like a good question. It, 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 will, it will be, I mean, the, the feedback is going to be, I'm focusing on this one, said it isn't substantially similar. Yeah. And the feedback you get is you're going to have to have argued that your client has no duty to mitigate uh, because it's what not substantially similar. Yeah. Had I tried the same thing and said no uh, instead, I'm trying to see if I've got, and I think I do, uh, what happens if, if no? National's going to argue that your client's, uh, I mean, I've explained this. National will argue that your client is a clown. It's reasonable to accept birthday parties. Have you explained why this doesn't apply? Right. So, I mean, so I've given the arguments on both sides, and no matter which way you went down the tree, the questions will take you back to the argument, or the series of questions will take you back to the argument that would be made on the other side to see whether you have addressed, right. seen that argument and addressed it. I have not. I that seems to be kind of the archetypal essay question. Well, a lot of the questions have an ambiguity about, I mean, the mitigation questions are, is an area where it's not at all clear yeah. what is and what isn't sufficient. Sort of but that's still within yeah. a restatement rather than here we don't know what the law is, right. make the arguments about the law. Right. Now, if you go back to an earlier one, it's pretty easy, again, to ask the question, what arguments would you make? You as the instructor, having created this, right. have to think of what kind of questions will I ask. If, if I ask this question on an exam, what would I be asking of the student in terms of grading and critiquing that answer? Right. I guess the question, if you ask the question, here's a fact scenario, and a good answer begins, depends whether this In other words, that's sort of the, the overall question is ambiguous in terms of the, the legal construct to apply. Does that make sense? It, it makes a little less in that you would argue contracts and then you'd argue torts for the same fact situation. That you can easily deal with. Yeah. Why don't these? If you, they, they don't go to the mega level simply yeah. because this is a course in contracts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do that. But can you do it? Sure. Yeah. It's basically what you do. It's no different than, I think there are some Cali exercises which are trees. Yeah, now, right. and, and, now this, so this is and, and this is a tree. Right, right. 
It's just a tree built off making the student write down the answer first and focusing the student back on what they've written. And what do you do when they submit the answer? Do they s submit the, you know, tell the professor what they've done this? Do you do any, at the end, where they, do you do anything in response to that? I don't because I've given them the feedback at right. the end of the loop, as you saw. Right. Here's my feedback as to yeah. what was in that question. So why do you ask? Why do you ask them to tell you? Because I'm asking them to respond to how they have done what they were doing. You know, what is it? I don't care. Here's a, here may be the answer, but the point of this right. is, do you see these points as you're going along? Do you think about them? Right. No, maybe I'm just, it's like the very last Submit to Professor Bogan. Oh, that one. Yeah, why do you do that? That, there, there's no good reason except what I'm <laughs> Now I'll give you the bad reason. Yeah, right. Oh, have to skip over. But the, 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 the reason was I was counting sure. and identifying which students took it and which students didn't. This was a, exactly. Uh, I had never done that before, but in my last year of teaching, I retired two years ago. Uh, my last year, I got uh, the great good fortune of having two sections of contracts, one of 100 and one of 70. And you ran this by your institution's IRB? Nah, forget them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was the, one of the problems, and we'll discuss it. <laughs> but I had 170 students, and so I was asking who did this. Uh, and you know it was anonymous grading, but after the grading was completed, I got back and could match up who took it and how'd they do. Are you going to talk about the results of that? I'm yes. Just curious. <laughs> but I'll hold it for a second. The only thing I wanted to show here, the first question was that simple uh, objective. And the easiest thing about this process for me was that we had free use of research assistants and I asked Harry Malone who was a student to create it. So Harry did a number of these questions and Eric Sherbine who was a later student did a few other of the questions and I looked over what they had done in putting the, the, the structure together uh, and corrected a number of things that they had done wrong but faculty who really got interested in this could make it much more, more sophisticated. Because all you're doing is this. Here's, the first is the question. The second is an answer to that question, which will be the last thing that would appear. Then after that, that's really what you're doing. If the answer to the question one was yes, you'd be taken to question number two. If the answer was no, you'd be taken to question seven. In question seven, if you answered yes, you'd be taken to question eight. If the answer was no, you'd be taken to question five, which says, you're supposed to say something, dummy. Yeah. <laughs> go back and say something. <laughs> Pretend you said yes, and then we will go on from there. And the same thing goes, so you can see what you've done here is simply create the tree chart. Uh, and this was done in Excel. And what Eric and Harry did was submit the Excel sheet to somebody who knew what they were doing <laughs> and could put it up. Uh, and I, for years, I did this in the uh, lab, the computer lab upstairs. And students would have to go into the lab to take this. They'd be locked in. You could only take it, go through once, and be locked in and locked out as soon as you could not get out. <laughs> once you'd started the question, you had to complete that question go all the way through it before you could get out of the system. But once you're on the, on the net, of course, hit backspace or exit, you're out of there. I got very few students to take it. Those who did do the exercise said they loved it, but having to come in at the right time and place was an annoyance. And students, when I started this, which I started in the 80s, were not as familiar with computers. When I did this two years ago, the students then 
uh, everybody had a computer, everybody had access to the web, it's up on the web, bingo. And so I got um, more than half of students took it. Now to get back to the other question. First, this is Alan Tyree's response. When he did it at Sydney, uh, students were given a choice. You can take the tutorial system or attend tutorials, one or the other. Live or Memorex? Half the students chose to computer tutorials and did slightly better than the exams than those who had live. And liked it better to be able to do it when they wanted and to get immediate feedback to them and not to the rest of the people. But he said, well, it's not, they did better, but not statistically significant, small number. I had my 170. With my 170, this is the uh, section one and section two. Section one, quiz takers, uh, that's those people who took one question, just one, or counted as quiz takers. There were 37 questions, I think. I, I can't remember the number. You could go back there and count it. Those people who took five or more questions, you saw that offer, or damages had nine questions on it. If you did after the whole unit more than five questions, five or, or more, grades were 3.081. People who did not indicate that they had taken this was 2.846. Section two, 3.173 for uh, takers of any significance, non-takers 3.856. That's sort of a plus or a minus differential. Then I do beautiful things, because you can do those things with PowerPoint, you know, like uh, what the differentials are between those who took it, those who took uh, five or more. Looked at individually, how many questions did you actually take? And then you get some peculiar things. Those who took between 10 and 14 questions, they didn't do as bad as those who didn't do it at all, but they did worse than people who took fewer. That was section one. And even here, those who did 20 to 24, but not more, did worse than those who did 15 to 19 questions. Weird results, that seemed to be replicated. <laughs> if, you, if you took a lot, but stopped before really going through, generally didn't do as well as others. Then I bulked it up into those who did five or more, 15 or more, and see what that little click does. And there's the last of my little charts. Now I'll get back to the Real question. I mean, I was curious about this. I ran it, and the question was, does it have an effect? Those numbers all show something where those who took and took lots of it did better than those who didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you? <laughs> Why doesn't that have any significance at all? I just gave you those numbers, and they were pretty. It doesn't have any significance for several reasons. You had to put in if you took it. Well, there are people who put in X or zero or didn't identify themselves. And you know, among those people were me. I would go in to test the question, not realizing like a Dumbo that if you do that, you're going to be recorded. <laughs> so non-takers are really not non-takers. They're people who refused to identify <laughs> themselves, and I can't distinguish between them. So what this really showed was the difference between those people willing to confess that they took it <laughs> and those who either didn't take it or didn't admit to taking it. Secondly, no statistical significance, of course, because and why didn't I go through all of the stuff like, like uh, Alan did or could do at, at Sydney? And the answer is, 
I let whoever wanted to take it, take it. I got more than half the class taking it. Uh, those who took it enjoyed it, thought uh, well of it, but it, they may be more motivated. Um, and you can almost tell that, that those who did 25 or more in every case were doing better than those who did fewer. And the ones that didn't have the motivation to take the 25th question, <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't make it that far. And of course, the particular questions I used could have reflected the essay questions that I, I didn't think they did, but they could have. So there's absolutely no statistical significance to any of the figures that I showed. What is significant, I think, the reason for being here and trying to talk about it is that I think that this exercise itself is useful for students. Um, that's why I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> and it didn't show, one thing it didn't show was that the time taken in doing this kind of an exam was taking away from the learning process of the students. Instead, I'm getting something different. The student's response is, look, this was something that gave me some reassurance about what essay questions are. I really liked doing it. I liked getting this kind of feedback at my own pace. I thought it was a great idea and it made me feel better. And for that reason, I think that it's a good thing to do. Uh, I think that it's more reassuring to faculty than having something that has a right answer. And it is more, promotes more student writing without actually any faculty member having to sit down and grade the whole darn thing. You can, and I'll say that literally, you can write a much better program than this. You can do it much more sophisticated. And all of these were set in the context of here is a con an offer or an acceptance question. Here is a damages question. But you can because you'll just loop it around to whoever answers will come to the next one. You can make it multiple issues. You can have offer and acceptance and damages issues and consideration issues all in the same question and bring them back. Now, Alan also asked questions in a way so that he could actually grade and use that as one of the grading mechanisms. I think that it's less desirable as a mechanism to test students, but I think it's a good way of actually teaching students, giving them the reassurance that they have taken this material, that they understand it, um, and uh, that it's a useful variant. It performs many of the functions that uh, Cali lessons perform, but by giving students an opportunity to actually write uh, an essay answer and think about their answer in, in those terms, uh, I think it's more productive uh, and of what students will usually face. And I'm not suggesting in any way this is the only thing you do, just that it would be useful at them. The answer to, to both of those is no. Uh, the answer to, to the second one, uh, no, is I'm not, sh it is true that one of them was based on a, a final exam question. Most of the others were not. Remember these were, most of these in fact were made up by a teaching assistant who did not have me in contracts. And in fact said, I'd like to do this because he was a law review student, a very bright uh, fellow who also did uh, work in, in uh, computers, and so he understood what he was doing in structuring this, but he didn't do that good in contracts. <laughs> and he said, this would be a good way for me to review and learn this before I got to do the bar. And he's 
put it, and, and there were a few areas where I really had to say, well, this is why you didn't do so good at contracts. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I'm not currently teaching, uh, period. So I haven't taken that step. But I think if I went back, I might well take the step of putting it in and saying this is a requirement of the course. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I would like to have the, the two sections of 100 and 100, and, and this one has to, and this one doesn't, can't, you're excluded. There is, I mean, that begins to get the research problem. I mean, it's a, I think it, there's a tough ethical question once you're convinced that this is helpful. There's a tough ethical question in keeping anybody from it. Uh, and so I'm not sure that I can ever prove it. But I, I would sell it not as this is the way your grades go up, but that this is what I'm trying to sell it as is this is something that isn't that difficult to do once you understand what it is um, and is useful to students and they're going to enjoy it and they're going to get some practice that they won't otherwise get and feedback more importantly than they won't otherwise get. This is Alan. <laughs> Spite of the effectiveness of methods, younger staff shouldn't attempt it. Because my experience was other staff and other students are extremely hostile. Doesn't matter that it works. <laughs> this should have some resonance to people in the Cali. <laughs> Doesn't matter whether it works or not. Law schools are just too conservative for this. Um, so I say, you can go back at any time and find both everything that Alan has said and everything that I've said about this and go back and look at those exercises to see what you think about it. I think it's not too difficult to improve on what I've done. <laughs> that part, I guarantee you. Um, but I think it's an interesting thing. I'm trying to encourage people to, to think about that in hopes that uh, somebody else will start doing it. Yeah. Any questions? It's a beautiful day. <laughs> Thank you. So how long does it take to develop something like that? I guess it depends on the question. How many branches are well, there? Well, remember, step number one, hire a research right. team. <laughs> thought it was a good question. Yes. Now all you have to do is create the tree. You, you've got to stimulate a yes, no answer. <laughs> you've got to know that. And with a what would you advise? And then you have to think through what are my points, what are my issues, where do I want them to take them to? If you ask a question and you have, some of us do, some of us don't do a model answer. If you don't do a model answer, so you don't really know what the answer is, then it'll take you longer. <laughs> if you do some kind of a model answer so it's already there, then it takes you less time to figure out what it was that you wanted people to do. And here's the other really nice thing about it. If you put it out and you're not using it for grading, a student can come back to you and say, boy, but I thought of such and such, or this was the problem with such and such. And you say, yeah, it doesn't hurt the student that they found a, a, a wrinkle or a problem but it enables you to fix it or deal with it or add it into the answer or however you want to fix it up. So it, anybody could do a, as you do practice exam questions, you could do one or two of these. It wouldn't take up a whole lot of time to do it. Um, but to do a complete set for the course, that takes a fair amount of time, it just as you'd think. If you were trying to do multiple choice questions uh, for a course as you were going through each issue, 
It would take time. I, I was teaching at Denver, and a couple of the faculty there decided that they were going to do quizzes at the end of each section. And again, students appreciated getting feedback right away after they'd learned a certain amount. But they found that it takes time to think up the questions that you were to deal with that material. Um, and that they tended to try to keep secret before they were put out. So all of those things kind of, uh, I think it can be done relatively quickly. But again, how much time exactly? You can, you can do a small little unit um, in a couple of days. All of contracts, all of torts. <laughs> a little longer, or a much larger staff. Thanks. You would ask about the technology. Yeah. Um, I didn't do any of it, but I migrated it from our old website to our new website. The database under the hood is just a Microsoft Access database, and the, uh, the web pages are ASP, classic ASP basic pages. Um, all just, of the, sorry. You just surpassed. Okay. <laughs> um, we don't have 